coming up on Cronkite Sports Report. There's a growing tradition that's wreaking havoc in the Valley sports scene. I was brought here to make this team a top 25 team, and that's really hard to do. And the guys know that, and that's what drives me every day when I get up. A community known for its older population is bringing in students to help bridge a generational gap in the game of golf. It's known for like older people, but kids can do it too. And a Hall of Fame bound NFL player known for his time with the Raiders. How his legacy lives on in the Valley. We were sitting in the hotel room and the President Hall of Fame came and knocked on the door pretty loud and uh, you know, my heart dropped. That and more next on Cronkite Sports Report. Welcome to Cronkite Sports Report. I'm Elaine Wilson. And I'm Lucas Robbins. And as student journalists here at ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, we look to bring you exciting sports stories with an Arizona connection. Thanks for joining us. Over the next half hour, you'll see stories from the high school to the professional level, all from across the valley. As we hit the month of March, many college basketball programs have one thing on their mind, March Madness. But for one local program, it's a dream that'll have to wait a few years. Danielle Urich went out to Grand Canyon University to see how the Lopes are rising in the Division I basketball scene. In a sea of purple, noise and energy shake the walls. Those who visit this environment don't know what they got themselves into, while those who call it home wouldn't have it any other way. Everyone in GCU Arena is here for one reason, the Grand Canyon University men's basketball team. The team is in the third year of its Division I transition under head coach Dan Marley, and the former NBA All-Star has big goals for his players. I was brought here to make this team a top 25 team, and that's really hard to do. And the guys know that, and that's what drives me every day when I get up and when we practice and when we go hard, is what's going to happen a couple years from now. So we stay focused on that. It's what we're really together this year, and we're really bought in. And I think you know we've got a ton of talented, talented players, and um, just you know we're unselfish. We love to play together. We love to play for each other, and I think that's huge. The players on the court aren't the only crucial part to this team. They also have players in the stands that bring energy, noise, and pride to GCU Arena. Those key players, the Havocs. Oh, biggest party in college basketball. I think um, I've never been a part of something like this. We only hold about. You know, not even 8,000 people in here, but it sounds like there's 12, 13, 14,000. So the Havocs are huge for us. They're like our six men. What started as a few students painting their face and mocking the visiting team in 2012 turned into over 2,000 in the stands. The basketball team here, like, they're really sociable and, like, know a lot of people. And so it's like you're cheering for your friends, you know. It's not just like you're cheering for, like, celebrities and athletes. And so I think it's pretty intimidating to the other team when you have you know, a couple thousand students just like staring at you and yelling at you. There was a game two weeks ago, a home game, where uh, the coach was trying to signal to one of his players to call a timeout. And uh, the players like went over to the sideline and were just like screaming at him like, coach, we can't even hear you, we can't hear what you're saying. And like it actually made a huge impact on the actual game itself. With inspiration from Gonzaga's student section, the Kennel Club, the Havocs have created their own traditions that lead to havoc in the arena. The most beloved tradition, though, happens right before tip-off. Right before tip-off, um, you know, everybody stands and points at the other team and jumps, which is pretty cool. I think it, it looks really cool on camera. They have their, their pre-game rituals, and they get ready and stuff, and they get smacked in the face with kind of 2,000 students jumping and pointing at them. It's kind of intimidating. With the thousands of students rallying behind them, Marley and the players strive to be a top team in the NCAA. But due to a four-year probationary period required for D1 transition, they will not be eligible for the NCAA tournament until 2018. If we were playing for something really substantial like a, a WAC tournament and an NCAA bid, this time of year our guys would be really ramped up. So it's tough to keep them motivated because they're not really sure you know, what's at the end. But like I said, you got to think beyond that of what we really want to become. You can look back of all the teams that transitioned from Division I to Division II in their third year. Uh, there hasn't been a record like this, not even close. In Phoenix, this is Danielle Yurich for Cronkite Sports.
Grand Canyon finished with one of the best records in the WAC, but as part of their transitional period, they will not be able to participate in the conference tournament. And despite that, that hasn't stopped fans from coming out all season long. GCU had an average 5,600 fans coming out to their games, and that's the highest they've had as a Division I team and the highest in the conference. And as students continue to flock to GCU Arena, the opposite can be said about the golf course as the game is losing popularity among young adults. One country club owner here in Arizona is finding a way to bring more youth and students to the game. Sun City Country Club owner Tom Lagering says owning a golf course today is challenging. I think about one third of the clubs are making money, uh, one third are breaking even, and a third of the clubs are losing money. Lagering is trying his best to continue to grow his business and grow the game in the process. He created a nonprofit organization called Golf Program in Schools, which offers basic golf lessons to Valley High Schoolers. They get six classes on campus in their PE class, then they come to the course and they get a three hour, four hour uh, field trip. Launched in April of 2015, Golf Program in Schools, or GPS, teaches the game's fundamentals. Last year, when GPS first began, it had 80 students. Now, there are more than 3,000. I actually think it's kind of cool that we're kind of doing this now, because I thought PE was just going to be like dodgeball and stuff, but actually getting to come out to a golf course, and it's actually pretty cool. Most of us teens view golf as something for old people, you know, because it requires patience and time, and we say we don't have time for that. But when I actually got into it, you know, it's different. You have to try it. GPS is free for school districts and their students. Lagering's goal is to expand the program from the current seven Peoria schools to all 44 high schools on the west side. For more information about GPS and Sun City Country Club, you can go online to golfps.org. Coming up on Cronkite Sports Report, football is the more popular full contact sport, but some parents are sending their children in a different direction. When I picked up in 2009, there were like eight kids. Uh, we're now in at almost 100 kids. We take a look on what is bringing kids to the game of rugby and a sport that is passed down through the generations. It made me feel so good that I wanted to share with the world everywhere I could and with anyone I could. A look at the role hoop dancing plays in Native American culture. Welcome back to Cronkite Sports Report. We continue now with a look at Arizona's younger athletes. More and more kids in the desert are playing a sport that was born across the Atlantic Ocean, over 5,000 miles away. Torrance Dunham tells us why parents are encouraging their kids to play rugby. It spawned one of America's favorite sports, football. But while tackle football participation is on the decline, rugby is making its presence known at the youth level across the country. Joel Borey has been a part of the Scottsdale Wolves youth rugby team for nearly eight years. And in his time with the team, he has seen the growth of the sport firsthand. So when I picked up in 2009, there were like eight kids. Uh, we're now in, at almost 100 kids. So we've had like a exponential growth of like 30 to 50% per year the last three, four years. So yeah, very fast growth. According to the Sports and Fitness Industry Association, rugby has exploded at the youth level in the United States, nearly doubling in the years between 2009 and 2014. Also during this same time period, tackle football is down more than 10%. A big reason for the growth of rugby is females. According to USA Rugby, female participation in the sport grew 114% in the years between 2013 and 2015. There's a sport that's literally one of the hardest in the world and it's exact same rules for men and women. Same size field, same size ball, same size intensity, same rules, same everything. And once you start it, you just get hooked. Injuries in the sport of football are well known, but the sport it originated from shares the same physicality without all of the protective gear. According to Banner Concussion Center Medical Director Dr. Steven Erickson, the difference is in the technique of tackling. Well, the way that uh, rugby is played and the coaching surrounding rugby 
Um, the technique is safer because you don't lead with your head, you lead with your hands, you use your shoulders more, and you're not going to put your head on somebody to make a tackle because it's going to hurt. Even with the safer technique, Dr. Erickson said there is still as much risk for concussions and head injuries, and trying to decrease these types of problems lies in the coaching of both sports. Good coaching in football and good coaching in rugby isn't to use your head as a weapon, it's to use your hands, it's to use your shoulders, it's to hit head up. Um, and you know, not to use your head as a weapon. So anything that uh, makes either sport safer would be through the coaching. Even with the risk involved, Crosby believes if the techniques are followed, the sport can be generally safe. My oldest daughter does play rugby. I'm okay with the risks because I know the game in and out. And not only that, but as a coach, uh, we coach correct tactics. So you're always gonna get you know, any sport that has a risk you know, to bodily harm, you're going to have coaches that have good technique and coaches that have bad technique. So, um, but if she's taught correctly, the sport can be really, really fun and really, really safe. Reporting in Phoenix, Torrance Dunham, Cronkite Sports. More kids may be playing rugby, but high school football is still a passion for many. At Chaparral High School, two Valley athletes have more than just a passion, but they have a legacy to uphold as the grandchildren of the late Ken Stabler. Stabler is a member of the 2016 NFL Hall of Fame class that will be inducted later this year. Stabler won a Super Bowl with the Oakland Raiders and is a household name for Raider Nation, but his legacy lives on in the Valley. Kerry Crowley takes us out to Chaparral High School, where these young athletes continue to take the field despite the dangers of football, which they know all too well. For brothers Jack and Justin Moyes, the football legacy at Chaparral High School in Scottsdale is not the only piece of the game's history they're a part of. The twins are grandsons of the late Ken Stabler, an NFL MVP with the Oakland Raiders, who will be inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in August. It was, you know, it was crazy, you know. You never really saw it coming. We were sitting in the hotel room and the President Hall of Fame came and knocked on the door pretty loud and, uh, you know, my heart dropped. Stabler passed away in July after a bout with colon cancer, but also struggled with memory loss later on in his life. Two weeks before Stabler was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Researchers at Boston University studying the quarterback's brain concluded that he had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, otherwise known as CTE. CTE is a diagnosis based on multiple, multiple poorly treated or untreated head traumas in a genetic susceptible individual that results in neurodegenerative disease. Stabler's diagnosis was unsurprising to his grandsons who began noticing memory issues in recent years. As I got older, I started to, you know, pay more attention to that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, you could kind of see it in his everyday life. You know, he, he repeated a lot of stories um, that he told you hours before, the day before. The list of football icons with CTE continues to grow. But Dr. Erickson is hopeful increased safety measures will keep participation up. Um, the, the most important thing in making them safe is them identify, them being able to identify when they're injured and not to play through injury. We teach athletes that it's okay to play with a sore ankle or a sore back, but then at the same time we're trying to teach them that it's not okay to play with a sprained brain. While their grandfather's diagnosis changed their viewpoint on the sport, their desire to play the game remains undeterred. Everyone, everyone that plays the game, you know, knows that there's a there's a risk factor, but you know it, that's what comes with it. So, uh, you know, you just can't play. You can't play thinking about it, but yeah, you know, it, it's there. It definitely changed the way I think about it now. But of course, when I get on the field, it's not going to matter to me. I just want to, you know, hit someone because I play defense and whatnot. Despite suffering from CTE, Stabler still shared his championship recollections and locker room stories with his grandsons and gave them memories to last a lifetime. I started playing defense actually my sophomore year here at Chaparral and uh, he'd tell me all about, you know, Jack Tatum and all those players and he, you know, he'd uh, explain how they played and uh, he told me how I should play like them. Though the Moyes brothers have seen the risks of football firsthand, they're excited to continue honoring their grandfather's Hall of Fame legacy on the field this fall. In Scottsdale, I'm Kerry Crowley, Cronkite Sports. Both Moyes brothers said that, that one day they hope to have children who play football and would honor their family name and tradition. Coming up on Cronkite Sports Report. I think this is more of like my internship to coaching. A Sun Devil great returns to Tempe in an entirely different role.
Welcome back to Cronkite Sports Report. We're here on ASU's downtown campus, and our next story takes us to Arizona State's Tempe campus. Yeah, that's right. You know, they say home is where the heart is, and that statement couldn't be more true than for ASU softball pitching legend Dallas Escobedo. She's returning for the 2016 season after being drafted number one in the National Pro Fast Pitch League two years ago. Now, it's safe to say she's found some comfort here in the Valley of the Sun. It's not often that a three-time All-American and one of the most decorated softball players in school history returns to the school where she once flourished and becomes a graduate assistant. But as she was getting ready for her second summer in the National Pro Fast Pitch League with the Philadelphia Rebellion in 2015, former Sun Devil great Dallas Escobedo decided that she wanted to come back to the school where she shined and help the Arizona State softball team. Coming back was pretty easy. Uh, I was able to talk a lot with Coach Wagner. He was here my freshman year and um, coming back last year and being able to just kind of watch as a fan, I didn't really like it because I wanted to be in on the action and helping the girls out. So I asked him about it. The position was open and kind of fell into place. Escobedo, who is second in school history in career wins and strikeouts, won a national championship in 2011 when Robert Wagner, now ASU's co-interim head coach, was an assistant with the team and he believes that she gives ASU an advantage, especially when she throws batting practice to the players. We're fortunate to have somebody like Dallas. I mean, she brings a positive perspective, she brings a positive attitude. Um, she's able to, to give us a look in the circle, you know, as, as preparation that um, not a lot of people can do. Just by her spin and when she throws to our batters, like, it's so incredible having a pitcher of her caliber throw to our hitters before we even start a season. Like, we're so far ahead of where we were last year. It's, it's awesome. My role is more of uh, just as a support. I'm here if they need me to pump them up. Uh, as a pitcher, I'm here to kind of embody anybody that they're going to face uh, for the next coming up series. And so whatever they need, I'm pretty much their girl. Escobedo also wants to teach some of the younger players what it means to play for Arizona State. To me, it means uh, family, commitment, hard work, determination, just all of that embodies the Sun Devil way. And I'm excited that I'm back and kind of putting it on to the girls that uh, are younger and I haven't played with. And so just being able to share my experience and make them have a great one too. In addition to working with the softball team, she is also getting her master's in autism and behavior analysis at ASU with the goal of one day becoming a special education teacher but staying in the softball culture is still at the top of her list. I think this is more of like my internship to coaching, I guess. I'm learning so much from Coach Wagner and Coach Letty, uh, being able to just work with them and see them and how they uh, put it on the players each day and kind of just taking like mental notes for me and being able to take what they have worked and see how the girls improve from each thing and kind of just go from there in my own philosophy. So yeah, I think so. Whether she is learning in the classroom or learning on the field, Escobedo appears ready to accomplish whatever she is asked to do. In Tempe, I am Julian Lopez, Cronkite Sports. You know, I saw Escobedo play back in high school at St. Mary's. We both went to St. Mary's together. You know, she was quite the player there and at ASU, so it's good to have her back in the Valley. Yeah, she was absolutely dominant in the circle for the Sun Devils, and it's only going to help these young pitchers at ASU with her on the staff. Coming up on Cronkite Sports Report. There's a training regimen that would rival anything you see a football or basketball player do. College sports programs are often used to help build a culture, but Native American groups across the state and the nation are using one sport to keep their culture blossoming. Welcome back to Cronkite Sports Report. We end our show with a sport that transcends mere competition. A sport that's about more than just who wins. A sport that has weaved itself through generations of Native American culture. Christina Vicario has more. 13 hoops, vibrant tribal garb, and a dance in time with the beating of a drum. Hoop dancing is a sport that generations of Native Americans use to tell a tribal story. Seven-time senior champion Terry Goodell says this dance has given him more than just trophies. I was a young man growing up on a reservation called the Tulalip Reservation, and I was really down on myself about being Native, and I felt a little less than everybody else. And one day I saw this dance, and I decided I needed to learn this because of the way it made me feel. Goodell's newfound pride cultivated a desire to teach his own children. 
it made me feel so good that I wanted to share it with the world everywhere I could and with anyone I could. And as my kids grew up, I wanted them to know what I felt, and I wanted them to have that feeling of pride being a Native American. For Goodell's son Michael, hoop dancing gave him an avenue toward self-expression. So I was really shy when I was a young boy. I guess I didn't really start speaking for myself until I was like four years old. Um, but when I, when I began learning the hoop dance, it helped me to express my thoughts and feelings in a way other than words. And so once I was able to do that, words started coming. Identity followed words, and soon Goodell was living up to his Indian name. When I was young, my grandmother uh, gave me an Indian name, a Lashutsi name, and the name is Sisahub, which means little dancer. That's kind of what happened with me, uh, especially learning the dance from my dad. It really helped me to figure out who I am. Each year, the sport culminates in the World Champion Hoop Dance Contest in February at the Heard Museum in Phoenix, a familiar event for both father and son. The contest contains two elimination rounds and a final round in each division. The world champion hoop dancer is then crowned out of the adult division based on six criteria. The categories contain precision timing and rhythm, showmanship, creativity, and speed. Preparation for this sport is rigorous. There's a training regimen that would rival anything you see a football or basketball player do. There are some use weights, some use strength conditioning, running, you name it. There's a number of very strenuous training regimens for each hoop dancer because they are in constant motion throughout the entire performance. For children like six-year-old Riley Sandberg, routine comes through observation of elders. Like when I first saw someone hoop dancing, like let's say if I was, I was trying to copy that person. And then I, I just thought of a new one and then I started adding it together. And then I knew more. From six years to 60, hoop dancing is a sport where generations come together to celebrate what hoop dancing has given them, pride in an ancient heritage. In Phoenix, I'm Christina Vicario, Cronkite Sports. And that'll do it for this edition of Cronkite Sports Report. I'm Lucas Robbins. And I'm Elaine Wilson. From all of us here at Cronkite Sports, thank you for joining us.